All right, hello and welcome. I'm Jason Whitlock. Colin Cowherd is still in South Beach, sun tanning. We're joined now by Fox NBA analyst Chris Broussard and Fox UFC analyst Kenny Florian. Kenny's here, so you know we're talking UFC. To the biggest event of the summer, Mayweather Pacquiao. Mayweather McGregor, I'm sorry. I called it a UFC event. It's a boxing event. The two fighters face off August 26th and launch a four-city press tour tonight, which you can watch live on FS2. Yesterday, UFC president Dana White was here, and he agreed with me that race will be a huge selling point for the fight. It's the Irish thing. The Irish thing is big. And, uh, yes, you have an African-American who is arguably the greatest of all time against an you know, off the charts, charismatic, incredibly hard punching Irish fighter. It's huge. Listen, I I think some people are afraid of this topic and think it's automatic negative. It's not when it comes to the fight game. Mm -hmm. This has been at the heart of the fight game from the outset in all combat sports, race sells. And as Dana said, the Irish versus the African-American long history of that in boxing. The reason why cash registers are ringing is because, again, whether we like it or not, I don't mean this negatively, but Floyd and Conor both fit some athletic stereotypes about their race that make for great television, make for great tension, and a lot of discussion points. And this this reminds me of when Larry Holmes, when I was young, was fighting Jerry Cooney. And me and one of my best friends argued about it every day. He was white, I was black. Larry Holmes going to kick his butt. Same thing's going to play out here with Floyd, and Floyd will kick Conor McGregor's butt. <laughs> you know, <laughs> listen, I, I think there's definitely a story to it. Uh, I mean, they made a few Rocky movies uh, about yes! that same story. <laughs> so uh, I think that that's definitely a, a legitimate story. But I do think there's other things to it, obviously. Um, you know, there's a lot of other white mixed martial arts fighters that would not make this fight as big. Um, I think it's the energy that they bring, the fact that you have two dynamos in their respective sports, Um, You know, these are the two pay-per-view kings uh, going at it, and I think that's what it's about. Yeah, look, race is a factor. There are certain ethnic groups, though, that bring what exactly what Dana White was saying. The Mexicans, they bring the same thing with their fight game. So it could be Irish, Mexican, African-American. It's a factor. I don't think it's the number one factor. Not the What's number one? The number one factor is you've got this outspoken, flamboyant boxer who's undefeated, claims he's the best ever and always playing up his record, versus a more outspoken, more flamboyant MMA fighter who knocks everybody out. And he's disrespecting Floyd in a way we have not seen anybody do, at least not in recent memory, calling him out. I'm knocking him out in the fourth round. If I, I, I believe this sincerely. If Conor McGregor was black, and doing exactly the same thing he's done, fur coat, taking people's belts at the, at the press conferences, all that, calling Floyd out, I believe it'd be just as big, honestly. See, I, I agree with, with the point that you're making with him being extremely flamboyant. We have not ever seen anyone call out Floyd at the level that we've seen him call out his opponent. But to your point, I, I truly believe and agree with, with you, with this is a race-selling fight. Bottom line. Number when you, one? You think number, number one. one? When you look, if you take a person who's not even a boxer or not an MMA fan, if they watch this and they see what's going we yesterday, yesterday, Dana White was in studio. He asked four black guys, yourself being one of them, <laughs> myself and you, and Eric Davis, who do you guys, did you say Connor? No, but did you say Connor? <laughs> did I say Connor? I, I didn't say it was, but <laughs> if you take a non fan of sport and you put these two men in front of them, guaranteed white America is going to side with Connor because it just, it, he looks like them. Irish no, I, or not, how many Irish black guys do you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, be real, let's well, be real. No, I, I do believe that it That's will funny. break down a long racial line. Look, let's, let's call it what it is. Black men. Two main areas in mainstream America that we've been able to dominate. Sports, football and basketball and boxing, track and field, sprinting, and hip-hop. Or entertainment, pop culture to some degree. If if Mayweather is beaten and knocked out by McGregor, 
Vanilla. A ice. lot of brothers. <laughs> if Vanilla Nice, they gonna feel. They might feel emasculated. Honestly, if True. Vanilla Nice yeah. out raps Tupac, there's a problem. <laughs> you got a problem. I mean, Eminem, why can't we Eminem, use Eminem? Hey, Eminem, let's Eminem, use Eminem, Eminem please. Everybody out, there's a problem. I got, and look, I got no problem if, if white guys, because blacks have dominated boxing for roughly a hundred years. Yes. I mean, for the most part. If there are white guys looking at McGregor and feeling some swag back and, like, pulling for him, I'm cool with it. I got no problem with it. So I think that's true. But I just think this fight sells itself yeah. it because does, of their personality. It does, too. And what I love about and this is what I love about Conor myself, you typically don't get this from a white guy. No. You just don't. I mean, this, throw race. You just, but, but race has to be no, you don't. thrown you don't. in there. You, you, but when you look at him and you see his swag, you see his mouthpiece, he's talking trash to anyone who's opposing him. We don't see that. He, he's taking what Floyd's doing and he's just Absolutely. dialed it up yeah. that yeah. much yeah. more. Yeah. You know, he's White just taking Ali. that next level. <laughs> yeah, he's no, like, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm going to give you another one that may play for Chris. Again, and Larry Bird did it in a different way. But he played with a lot of swagger, talked as much smack as anybody yeah. in the league. And he and Magic Johnson had something that took basketball to yeah. another level. True. And, again, I hope people will allow people to root for whoever the hell they want yeah. without going to jump into, oh, you're a bad guy because you're rooting for this person or that person. Sometimes in sports, it's good, man. It's, it's this dynamic. The dynamic even between UFC and boxing. There's a lot of elements to yeah. this. If you're a NASCAR fan, there's a new podcast for you to subscribe to. Heritage Road, the podcast that drives you down memory lane, takes you under the hood, and gets you behind the wheel of America's favorite racing competition. They talk to the hardworking drivers, crewmen, and fans that made NASCAR possible then and now. From NASCAR royalty Bobby Allison to the broadcasters that brought racing into homes around the country, they've got all the stories you've probably never heard before. Hosted by the voice of Texas Motor Speedway, Rich Phillips, brought to you by Bush, the beer that has supported racing since 1979. Subscribe to Heritage Road today for free wherever you listen to podcasts. Now let's get back to the show. All right, welcome back. Greg Genius, Chris Broussard, and Jason McIntyre back. Let's move to Miami, where Pat Riley might have missed out on Gordon Hayward, but didn't miss out on an opportunity to take a shot at LeBron James. When asked about the Heat's pursuit of Hayward, Riley said, quote, in this game, you have to try and stay one step ahead of the posse, and in this uh -oh. game, the posse is in Cleveland. <laughs> of course, we all remember the hubbub over Phil Jackson's posse comments last year. I have no issue with Riley calling out LeBron's posse here. I said it at the time <clears throat> of the Phil Jackson deal. I think that the old school guys like Pat Riley and Phil, they got a problem with LeBron James and the exercising of power of, by players in the executive role and constructing teams. The old guys want to run the league. Uh, again, I'm going to go all the way back to our conversation earlier about Conor McGregor and, and Floyd Mayweather. Talking smack has always been a part of sports. And there haven't really been rules. There had, oh, my God, that's, that's personal. That's below the belt. I mean, we celebrated Muhammad Ali for basically analogizing Joe Frazier to a monkey. No one said that was out of bounds. It's sports. People talk smack. They say things that are impolite. And again, I just don't have a real problem here with Pat Riley and Phil Jackson and LeBron James wants to talk smack back to him. I got no problem with that either. I have no problem with it either. And when you, if I'm if I'm Pat Riley, I can't compete against LeBron James. I can't put on shorts and a uniform and say check up. I can't do that anymore. So the only way I can really try to do anything to give my team an advantage. Let me get to your head mentally. Who who would be best suited to do that than Pat Riley? Yeah. Who, who knows LeBron uh -oh. better than almost LeBron's anyone? LeBron's best no, buddy over here. The thing is, I don't think Riley was calling him out. It, I read the article in the Sun Sentinel. He said every, the context was everybody is chasing in the East. We're all trying to make the right move to get us ahead in the East. And we're you know, staying ahead of the posse, and the posse's in Cleveland. Like, I, I took it as he was saying the Cavaliers are the team everybody in the East is trying That's to beat. That's the word posse. Exactly. Trying, like, yeah, but I like, mean, so now nobody can use the word posse well, without Phil it Jackson it. Exactly. But, but, but Phil. Carter went at, or I mean, Phil Jackson went at LeBron's business manager, Maverick Carter, and Rich Paul, his agent, 
and called them a posse. I don't think he would have called Dan Gilbert, the Cavs' owner's best friends and w- business associates, a posse. And so you that's don't, different. You don't wow. think you don't think posse comes up because of all of that? You think I Pat don't Riley, think, now, you think I, Pat I don't Riley think so. uses the word yeah, posse? A Seventy-something-year-old guy just tossing it around. Pat casually. Riley is not Phil Jackson. Pat Riley is smart enough to know. I do not want to alienate. Forget LeBron. LeBron's never going back to Miami. Other players, you saw how other players caped up for LeBron with the posse comments against Phil Jackson. Pat Riley is not that dumb to get other players potentially associating him with a racist term or at least one that's put in that context. But at the same level, Chris, you remember Pat Riley's final meeting with LeBron where he tried to recruit him to Miami when he, but when LeBron left. Uh, the story says Pat Riley walks in the room. LeBron and his buddies are watching a soccer match. They're on their phones, just totally checked out on Pat Riley. I think Riley's still bent out of shape about that. This is two years ago, and now this summer, swings and misses with Gordon Hayward. I think Riley's a little bitter at what's going on in the league. He's signing Kelly Olenek to a $50 million no, no. deal. I, you make, you're nailing the point. It's Sports are emotional, and we act like only the players get emotional. Very we act like the people that have millions of dollars and their reputations uh, invested in this don't get emotional and fly off the handle and say dumb stuff. And, or, or say things that are supposedly out of bounds. The players do it. The executives do it. Ownership does it. I just wish we would all acknowledge that and not get bent out of shape because it's just competition. If I bounced on every one of my friends that I played with, whoever said something inappropriate to me, I'd have no friends uh, left from Ball State in my playing days. And those guys are actually my best friends, and they still talk smack on me. And so... I, I just feel like from Phil Jackson to Pat Riley to the players talking smack on the court, let's have some of that without getting all bent out of shape and demonizing people. All right, welcome back. Greg Jennings, Chris Broussard, and Jason McIntyre are back. Let's move to the NBA Summer League where Lonzo Ball set out with an injury last night, avoiding a matchup with the guy who embarrassed him in the NCAA tournament, De'Aaron Fox. When news of Lonzo's injury broke, Fox tweeted out a face palm, but after the game had this to say about Lonzo missing the matchup. I got hacked. Oh, you got hacked? <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's, he's a competitor. He's hurt. I mean, like, like people said, this is something that's more risky. You know, when I took my ankle, coach took me out and said the same thing. So, I mean, no one's ducking anybody. At the end of the day, we're still going to play each other again, both in the NBA for a reason. All right, I think it's pretty clear Alonzo was ducking Fox last night. And, and I say that in all seriousness. Listen, I, I, look, one of my best friends, Jane Knapp, is hardcore hoops junkie. He's been on me a month before the draft. Dennis Smith Jr. is the best guard in this draft. Lonzo Ball is overhyped. And one of the reasons he says he's overhyped, and it plays into this, remember Lonzo Ball, didn't, he got off the AAU circuit, played with his dad's team. Mm-hmm. That was avoiding De'Aaron Fox and Dennis Smith then. Just think of the narrative. He had been exposed over the AAU Summer League, getting destroyed by these these guys. He got destroyed by De'Aaron Fox in the NCAA tournament or uh, during the NCAA regular season. I think this guy, again, has a little competitive issue when it comes to Fox and a few of these other guys. I do think he ducked him last night. I I don't... Look... I don't think he... I, 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 I... <laughs> no, this happens all the time. Now, I don't like it. Ben Simmons set out three of the eight summer league games last summer, and Isaiah Thomas, the legend, went off on him. Like, why are you resting? They called it rest, too. They didn't say an injury. So, I don't think he's duck. If he's afraid of De'Aaron Fox, then the Lakers got big problems. He didn't play in the summer. I do years. not think he's ducking him. I just think that... This was their third game in four nights. They sat all their rookies. Unfortunately, this is what teams do now. They rest players in summer league. 19-year-olds. They're afraid of Didn't letting them Didn't you hear play. what I said? Ben Simmons <laughs> sat out three games last How summer. many games has Dennis Smith sat out in uh, the summer league? I'm with you. How about you. Jason Tatum? Any of the other top ten picks sitting you, out? But team, some teams Just admit make it. That Whitlock decision. is right, okay? I like Lonzo Ball a lot. I'm rooting for him. This is an embarrassment. You can't have Magic Was Johnson. Kuzma's ducking too? You can't have Magic Johnson come out and talk about, oh, he's going to break all my records. He's gonna, and then he's sitting out a summer league game a week later. 
Greg, this you is said synthetic. It, you said it against Ball State several times. No, <laughs> never, ever, never. I, I, I wanted two of me to play in that game. No, for me, I don't think Lonzo is ducking. I think this was complete uh, management. It, yes. this, is, this is over Lonzo's ball. He doesn't get to say when he's going to sit and when he's not. So this management's is, protecting for me, him I from think, another no, 40 points. No, no, this is worse. Okay. No, 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 no. I would believe that more than I, 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 I definitely believe that, and I, I feel like they understand. We, why would we allow the media and, and everyone to overhype this in a summer league? You, We're not even talking about regular season. Let, let's Jordan wait till we at least get to the regular season. And another thing for me, number one, Lonzo... I'm just going to be real. I play ball. That was my passion. Lonzo can't guard De'Aaron Fox. That's his bottom line. He can't make him my goal. He he wasn't drafted to win a one-on-one game. He's not going to beat guys in one-on-one. No. There's a lot of point guards in this draft that would have wasted Lonzo Ball in one-on-one. Absolutely. But his game is different. They haven't played one-on-one. When it was Kentucky, UCLA, there were four other guys on both teams out there, and the guy gave him four. No, that was was, I see you. You can't check me right now. played him in the first game. It was more of a push. But, Greg, to your point, even if the Lakers are doing that, why are you protecting the future of your franchise? You're building well, around. No, 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 no. Why, why wouldn't you? Why are you protecting, you protect why are protecting a 19-year-old in summer league? Why, why you would can't you hide not? him in the regular season. Exactly. Right? But why would you not protect him right now? From he's what? What are you protecting him? No, no, getting that, toasted? He's that fragile. He's I don't know. Fragile. Exactly. Many of these millennials are millennial. Like millennial. millennial. I don't know the man like that. He could be fragile. That's what oh, I'm saying. Geez. I don't know. I don't think he is. To get, this, to, get to this point and to be afraid to compete, at a high level, the man didn't another... play AAU ball against the top competition. I mean, him I and his daddy you. pulled him off You're making a great and had point, him playing man. in a very little secluded situation <laughs> with a bunch of kids he could light up. Again, maybe the kid's a little bit fragile. And again, it just when we heard this, oh he, my groin. I mean, <laughs> he could have went. Now look, you would have liked to have seen him go on the Magic. Say, look, I'm playing. Let me play tonight. I want to play all eight games. He could have done that, but. I don't think he's ducking. He's not ducking. All right, welcome back to the show. Greg Jennings and Chris Broussard are back. Jason McIntyre is also here. Let's move to Oklahoma City, where Paul George will be introduced tomorrow as a member of the Thunder. Before leaving my Pacers, George made it clear he wanted to play for his hometown Lakers. But now he might be changing his tune, telling Sports Illustrated's Lee Jenkins, quote, if we have a killer season in OKC, I'd be dumb to leave that. I think there's a chance George will stay in OKC past this season. Listen, I I think Paul George didn't want to say this. He wanted out of Indiana. He Larry Bird left. They had tried different ways to construct a team that could get to a championship. I think more than he wants to be back in L.A., he wanted out of Indiana. I don't think he believed in what the Pacers were doing. And, again, that's no shot at Kevin Pritchard. That's just where I think Paul George landed. He gets to Oklahoma City. They're going to roll out the red carpet for a year. They're go- Russell Westbrook's going to be on his best behavior. He's a young guy. If they still relatively young. If they have success and he and Russell Westbrook hit it off, I can see a scenario where he signs for another year or two or whatever – to stay in OKC to play this thing out before just running off to L.A.? Yeah, I I could see it, too. I said when he got traded that if they get to the conference finals, maybe there's a chance to stay, or obviously the finals. Uh, Maybe even second round, you finish four seed, you lose to Golden State in a tough six- or seven-game series. Maybe he could stay, because I was hearing throughout the offseason that his number one priority was to win. Yeah, he wanted to go to L.A., play in his hometown, But number one was win. And that's why Cleveland, Cleveland was willing to give up a perennial all-star in Kevin Love to get him. They felt like they could keep him. The one caveat is why didn't he send that message to Boston and let them know, look, if we're good, they would be good. I'll stay. Maybe he didn't want to be in the conference with LeBron James. I don't know. But I think there's a chance if they have a great season. He he said it himself. For me, uh, have we not all paid attention to what just recently took place with KD leaving and all this. When you look at... when they went to the finals together, KD and (laughs) Russ? I I do do remember that. With him leaving and what transpired. Paul George saw that. Man, you looking at Oklahoma. 
one of the most loyal fan bases in all of sport, not just professional sport because they just got the OKC yeah. Thunder, but sport, loyal fans. Paul George is no fool. <laughs> He's not going to say, uh, you know what, matter of fact, let me see. He says, if we get a killer season, and then he goes on to say, or if we do something crazy like end up in the conference, like something crazy. If, if all this stuff happened, then maybe yeah. I might stay. But my, my point is, why would he say anything different? Exactly. Why would he say anything different? He didn't make the decision to go. He got traded. If it were up to him, I don't know if we see him in this. When it happened, we're all looking like, okay, see, why would he? Does it make sense? Is Sounds it a good like thing? Oh, no, Greg, Greg is 100% right. This is lip service to the fans Absolutely. and to the new franchise. He's saying all the right things, giving off the vibe that he wants to be there. I would say his chances of staying are about as good as mine winning the lottery. Which is basically none. So, no uh, chance. No chance. They, Hold on, Bruce Hardy. If they get to the conference finals, Lonzo Ball's a bust in year one. They win 31 Did games. you forget? He's going there? Kevin Durant and Russ went to the conference finals. They went to the finals before that. And he still and Durant left went to Golden State. Yes, he, he didn't did. go to a Lakers team in the lottery. Uh, that's a very fair point. However, Just ask. you're talking about Russell Westbrook and possibly changing. This is a guy who led the league in shots last you year. You act like it's Westbrook's the most terrible. most shots per game since Kobe. When See, Kobe was jacking he's for not going to do that I don't, next I don't think this oh, yeah, has just anything. Gonna the league and shot at I don't think this has oh. anything to do with Westbrook. I think he respects his game. We all know what he brings to the table as far as, as as a player goes. But when you look at the grand scheme of things, what players are looking at is how can I increase and advance my brand? Brand. Paul George has never been in a huge market. OKC is not a huge market. Indiana is not a huge market. To have an opportunity to put on that Laker uniform yeah. and you say, if Lonzo Ball is a bust, there, he can't become a bust if he does what we know he can do best, which is facilitate. In year one, look, I think he's going to be good. I'm saying in year one, if he doesn't play that well, if they win 31 games, finish 12th in the West, and no one else will go to L.A. with him, if LeBron doesn't go there, if Westbrook doesn't go with you, if Chris Paul, any of these other free agents don't, don't go to L.A. with you, why in the world would Paul George go to L.A.? So why would you to miss the playoffs? Because, because what Chris said... His number one agenda, and Greg, I'm sure you can relate to this, is winning. The locker room is a miserable place. Going to work when you're losing and getting your brains beat in, that's a miserable work Absolutely. experience. And so if they're with, they win 54 games next year and are a real threat in the postseason. And Sam Presti and these guys say, hey, look, we're going to add one more piece and make a run at it next year. Why winning is the great deodorant. Winning builds your brand better than the Absolutely. uniform you're playing in. Isaiah Thomas is play, you know, not Isaiah Thomas, but there's uh, Anthony well, Davis, Durant great player playing with the Pelicans. Oh, yeah. Oh, but but look how big Durant's brand was in OKC yeah. because they were winning in the threat. Listen, again, it, there is a little bit of a lottery factory to this. Certainly. Certain things have to happen. Westbrook's got to adjust a little yeah, bit. a lot. They got to win, and, you know, he's got to fall in love with Oklahoma, and that's tough. Uh, no, to your but point, it could though, happen. Uh, listen, with social media in 2017, you can build a brand anywhere. anywhere. Milwaukee, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. But, again, we, I keep going back to this. Last year on the show, I said, I believe Russell Westbrook is like Dwight Howard. Nobody wants to play with him. We saw Reggie Jackson have beef. Sergi Baca. Reggie Kevin Jack Durant. Reggie well, Jackson. Reggie Jackson wanted the You're same minutes. You're using Reggie Jackson hey, as proof? They shipped him out. What happened to Victor Reggie Oladipo? Jackson. We get Victor yeah. Oladipo yeah. last year. I never saw Victor great. Oladipo. Oladipo? Oladipo? That type of You're movie. bringing up Jackson? You... You haven't He's even mentioned, player. if you say Durant, I, I give you some love. We don't love. need to say Durant. You mentioned Oladipo and Reggie Jackson. Serge Ibaka. And Serge Ibaka. They all Ibaka. complain Come about on, playing man. with Russell. Some Come bonus. On. Toss some bonus in there. I'm joined today by Fox NFL analyst Greg Jennings, the founder of the big league, Jason McIntyre, and a new member to the Fox family, yes. yeah. Mark Slare, former Denver Broncos, Super Bowl champion, several times over. Carrie cat caddied for John Elway for a number of years. <laughs> All right, let's start in the NFL with former Packers linebacker A.J. Hawk, who took to the Players' Tribune to write about life after football, admitting that his wife threw a surprise retirement party and all but forced him to quit playing. Reminds me of another player's wife, Giselle <laughs> Bungeon. I've been saying for weeks that Tom Brady's wife has been trying to force his hand by putting rumors of concussions in the media. 
and I think she'll succeed. Mark, you, you're new to this argument. And right. Greg, you may have been out of town when I started this, but I feel like Giselle Blungeon calls the shots in that relationship, as she should. She has more of the money, and she has all the Giselle. That gives her a lot of leverage. <laughs> I think that... I think she's been playing a chess game with Tom Brady, and I read this A.J. Hawk story on Players Tribune, and again, you have to drag these guys away from the field, and that's what his wife did with this surprise retirement party, and that was like his hello moment that, you know what, maybe I am done and I'm retired because last year he came back and played with the Falcons, surprisingly. Uh, you know, you guys, I know Mark had to be dragged out. He had to, how many, how many surgeries did he have? Greg? For me, I, I, I get where you're coming from, and I can see where she is trying to throw subtle hints to where, Tom, it, think about this, at least think about it. I just, when, when it came to me and my retirement, and you can speak to this as well, my wife was my number one cheerleader, whether I was to continue playing or whether I was to say, babe, I'm done. And so for me, it's hard for me to see your spouse, your wife, the one who knows you better than mm. anyone else, trying to convince you to do something that you're not really ready to do. Is it what is it and could it be best for them? I don't know. I don't know their 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 dynamic. But right now, understanding where Tom Brady is and the level of play that he's playing at, age is just a number to him. His play is at the top of Every category so that we're looking she is too. <laughs> Absolutely. But when we look at Tom Brady, we don't look at a guy who's coming down the back end of a slow. He's continuing to excel at a high rate. So is Giselle. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so is Giselle, yeah. to your point. But Yeah, there's no question, Giselle. I mean, you know, our wives definitely have an influence, and they definitely have a voice. And, and you know, we have these discussions. There's a difference. There's, there's this old line that I love from a Randy Travis song. And, you know, I'm going way back, and a lot of people, this is going to be a, a lost reference. But since my phone still ain't ringing, I'll assume it still ain't you. That's the line. There's a difference when A.J. Hawk decides, you know, it's over. Your right. wife says, hey, listen, the phone ain't ringing four months. If Tom Brady walked away from the New England Patriots, his, his phone, phone would ringing. be ringing off the hook. There is a big difference there. Tom Brady, and I'm with you, the way he's playing, it's not like this precipitous slide that Peyton Manning was on. Tom Brady is playing at the top of his game. Now, I'll throw a monkey wrench in this conversation. I actually believe that Tom Brady says he'll play till 45. I actually believe he'll, he'll finish that career in a different uniform. And I look at the way they've gone about their draft. I mean, you look at what they've done. They've always been about compiling picks, right? And this year it was about trading unknown commodities, draft picks, for known commodities. They got a tight end from Indianapolis. They got a defensive end from the Carolina Panthers. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like to me. Party. Yes. No. <laughs> you know what it sounds like to me? It's a retirement no. party. It sounds, this is what it sounds like to me. We're going to go out and win a couple more championships, and then we're going to boot you out the door for Jimmy Garopp with Garoppolo, and maybe even, maybe even Bill Belichick's leaving. But this feels to me like they're setting him up to say, Hasta la vista, good luck in a Broncos uniform like uh, Peyton Manning did it, oh. and we're leaving wow. uh, on Giselle, a different train. Yeah, I, I, I got to side with Whitlock. You Greg, you said she's been subtle. I don't think begging Tom Brady twice to retire is subtle, followed up with the concussion stuff that went through this, this offseason. It just everything points to Tom Brady leaving at the end of the season. Remember, Jimmy Garoppolo, as you said, Mark, the clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. He turns 26 this year. And don't forget, as Whitlock said, they have lined up an awesome array of talent at wide receiver to kind of give Brady a good, an, an hasta mm -hmm. la vista this season. And I can't, what, you think he's going to go to Denver I to, think, after this season? Dude, I, I mean, the way he's playing right now, unless he has this fall Absolutely. like Peyton Manning has this fall. It's, he's not he, done. Well, he's, Giselle he's says gonna, retire, what if and he, he looks, says, I'm going to Denver. No, what if he looks like the guy he looked like for three quarters in the Super Bowl? Ooh. How about that? You know, he had an amazing fourth quarter, an amazing comeback. And I love Tom Brady. I'm not knocking. He's playing at a high level. But there is data. Once you get to be 40, you don't win playoff games at the quarterback quarterbacks position. But, at the age of 40 But year see, old. okay, That's so it. we're looking. Uh, let's, let's look at those three quarters. Look at his regular season and postseason play up until those three quarters. And then the fourth quarter, when, it, when we know it, it means the most and it counts the most for your star player, your quarterback, the guy who runs the show, the guy who carries all the weight, 
shows up like that. Don't forget the he, four-game vacation that the NFL gave him to start the season. So he only played 12 regular season games. I just don't see him being done playing at this level. I, I, He'll end up in a new... I don't either. I always look at it like this. You know, uh, Joe Gibbs, and I played for Joe Gibbs, one of the most regal people I've ever been around. I mean, just unbelievable. Love Joe Gibbs. He used to say this to us as a football team all the time. Great talent, makes plays in the first three quarters. Great character, wins games in the fourth quarter. That dude can win games. That's, that's all I'm saying. And I think, he'll, I think if he wants to play three more years, he'll still – hey, listen, man, there's such a dearth of talent in the quarterback position anyhow. Exactly. Even a half a Tom Brady is better exactly. than three-quarters of the guys that start this league. is going to win this argument. She wants him at home, <laughs> retire. Listen, neither of you had experience dating a supermodel. I've had plenty. <laughs>